morning. morning. So, as we face an apocalyptic vision of the future, the whole of mankind falls into turmoil. And as we see on a daily basis, the banks stealing your cash, robbing you blind of your savings, taking your money and running and buying houses and mansions and cars and everything else they want to spend your cash on, we fall on our backsides waiting for solutions. And we look to our leaders who at the same time are taking your cash and spending your cash and buying crap and crap and more crap that we have worked for. And probably, I'm assuming, I am guessing that the reason you are here this weekend is because you are looking for a solution. Is that right? Are you looking for a solution? Because we are tired. We are exhausted. We are cynical. We are unbelievers. We have lost faith in almost everything that this house was built on. And as you sit and watch your TV in the media, in the news, on the radio, or the magazines and the newspapers, you say to your partner or your friend or whoever it is that's close to you, what the hell is going on? Where is the future leading me? And of course, things like the internet can provide you with a solution. However, it doesn't change the fact the way the infrastructure has been built. So that when you get your cash and you put it in the bank, <laughs> these guys are laughing. They're laughing at you. They're laughing at me. <clears throat> so where do we look? Do we look to these internet gurus? Who said that? Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Actually, you should be looking at yourself. Because change will never happen unless you change yourself. Because inside of you, deep inside, not just inside, not just taking the jacket off, not just changing a few little things in your life, Deep inside you, on a cellular, structural level, is something that you need to change. And if you are not willing to change it, nothing will ever change. You will still be taken to the cleaners by this system. But Alan, this system has been set up to look after me. Yeah, <laughs> this system has been set up to control you. Simple. You're just ants in the colony. I'm just an ant in the colony. That's how they see us. That's how they see you. You are just there to be used, abused, or wasted, and thrown away at the end of it. So what is the solution for you? It's clear on a foundational level, we need change, right? So how do we get that change? How do you, sorry? Obama. Obama. <laughs> Don't start me on that one. <clears throat> <clears throat> no, politicians are only interested in one thing, and that's them. Because they feel they are born leaders, and they want the glory and the significance that goes with leading. And when it comes to the crunch, they will cut your throat. It's a fact. That's not me standing. Do you agree with that? 
Okay, so the question is really, what are you going to do to you? It's not about what anyone else is going to do for me. <clears throat> and the biggest fear you'll have in your life is confronting yourself. The biggest fear you will ever face is standing in the mirror naked. Well, that might be fearful for some people, of course. <clears throat> and really facing yourself and asking yourself deeper questions. What is this all about? Because I don't care what anybody does or buys at a seminar. You can buy the greatest package on the planet. I've traveled around the planet. I have no idea how many times. Speaking and lecturing and talking at seminars. And people run up to the back and they sign up for things and they buy things. Again, to add to their collection of stuff that they've already bought for the past five years. And that isn't to say that those products are bad, because all these guys that speak at this event and other events are friends of mine, and I know them as genuine people. We've got, we holiday together, we go out for dinner together, we sit on the beach together, we do stuff together. <clears throat> but if you don't change yourself, it won't make any difference. If you spend three grand this weekend and you do nothing with it, ask for a refund, and just to just to give yourself some penance, give the money to charity. You can do something decent with it. So the point being is that we have to look at ourselves for change. Right? Is that right, yes or no? Yes. <clears throat> but the biggest fear you have is looking at yourself. But your fear is based on an assumption of what may happen if you look at yourself and have to take control. But the problem with it is an assumption, it hasn't yet happened. And also, not only has it not happened, it probably won't take place. So your assumptions are usually wrong. <clears throat> so the one thing I want to really encourage you to do is have a look at yourself. And think about this stuff. Really think about this stuff. So listen, <clears throat> has anyone here heard of me? <laughs> Put your hand up. Who hasn't? So disappointing. <laughs> so disappointed to see all those hands. Okay, do you want me to tell you a quick overview? Is it worth going? Who am I? Why should you listen to me? Well, I was born in, I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, so I'm a Scotsman living in England. <clears throat> Always a Scotsman, of course. And I started my first business when I was 10. I used to repaint rally choppers, for those who remember those things. And after that, I had a sewing business. After that, I had a window cleaning business, I had a gardening business, car washing business, and lots of other little stuff. And with the sewing business, because we came from Edinburgh, and we, we lived on a prison officer's estate, uh, I, I took my dad's trousers up one day, uh, because he got this new prison uniform come in, the trousers are too long, and I said, oh, I'll take them up for you, Dad, if you give me 50 pence. And I took them up, and suddenly all these prison officers are bringing trousers to the house to be altered. So that was one of my first real big spinners, uh, making money taking up prison officers' trousers. And of course, I worked on farms and all the other stuff. My first kind of really significant job was when I decided to train as a hairdresser when I was 20. <clears throat> For the first four years, I'd been digging holes in the ground as a landscape gardener. <clears throat> Just literally digging holes, putting a tree in, filling the hole for four years. Totally mind-numbing. But it was good world experience, meeting people, of course, and all the usual stuff that goes with it. So I became a hairdresser in 1989. I bought my first hairdressing salon. Well, I put together my first hairdressing salon from a small unit. It was 250 square feet, and not long after, about 18 months after, we moved to a 2,000 square foot hair and beauty salon. And I ended up with three different hair salons at that point. During that process, of course, I had to learn how to take my business to market, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Because beyond hairdressing, in, people started to, I'm going to tell you the story in a second, a bit more depth, but people started to ask me to do marketing for them. And here's me cutting hair all day in the salon, and people were coming in and saying, who does your marketing? 
Who sends these letters out to the, your clients? Who puts the adverts in the paper? Well, it was me doing it upstairs or at home. Simple as that. So I started uh, being asked to do one or two uh, pieces of marketing, advertising for clients. And uh, it just kind of went from there, really. And since then, I've, oh, crikey, I've had some fabulous results, really. <coughs> did um, in, on stage in Australia, did uh, a charity fundraiser over three days for the Amazon jungle and raised about £71,000 in a couple of days. Uh, took a client, Kevin Lewis, from bankrupt to £2.4 million in 11 months. Um, Dave, David Lee, I think David, are you here, Dave? You were here yesterday. Oh, he's going to Australia. Uh, David Lee, who was here yesterday, I uh, showed him how to do a quarter of a million pounds in one weekend. Uh, lots and lots of things like this. I had a, had, a, had a guy who did 800 and something thousand pounds in 21 days. So lots of really spectacular results, which continually shock me, to be honest, when, when I see these things happening. And I just think, blimey, did I do that? Did I really help this guy? So <clears throat> it's been nice. And it's been great. Um, on the back of that, of course, you get invites all over the world. The first one I went to was, was in Russia. I went to uh, speak to a thousand hair and beauty salon owners, <coughs> which was completely weird because it was clearly very post-communist and all the s symbolism was still everywhere. So it was quite cool. But nobody spoke English. And I had to go in this theater and this lady went on stage and she introduced me in Russian. And everybody had headphones on, of course, and the translations were being done. And uh, the only time they would clap was when she would come out from the side and clap, and then we'd all go. <laughs> so, so it was a bit of a weird experience, but it was pretty cool, I have to say. And then uh, going to Australia, doing the fundraiser on stage, speaking in Malaysia. Uh, we flew to New Zealand just for... Uh, a day, we literally landed, did a talk and flew back, it was mental. And then last year, we finished our travels last year uh, with a trip to the Amazon jungle, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later, which was absolutely fabulous, living with a tribe for two weeks. Well, it was a week actually. We did a week in the, um, in the Andes, uh, we went up Mount Chimborazo and all these other wonderful places, and we did some shamanic stuff and some really out there stuff, it was, it was really cool. We did some really out there stuff, and uh, <clears throat> we ended up going into the jungle, flying over millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of acres of pristine rainforest, and eventually landing on this little strip of mud in the middle, and jumping out of the plane and going living with this tribe. So it's just cool, really. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because I decided at some point in my life that I had to recreate my life. I had to deliberately recreate my own life using natural laws. And these natural laws are the laws that are found within you. And these are the laws of your passion, your inner genius. It's deep in there. It's deep inside. You were born with genius. <clears throat> Every single baby that's born on this planet is born with pure genius. But the problem is, as you grow and develop, genius is hammered out by the system. And it's controlled, and it's covered, and it's boxed in, and it's boxed in.